Hi everybody and welcome to this webinar today, um, which we is on climate, COVID-19 and the collaboration we need. I can see there's quite a few of you already online, so we're going to um, make a start now. So this event today is the first in a series of webinars that is co-hosted by IIED and ICAD on climate, on the climate crisis and COVID-19 and working together for the change we need. Uh, so this is the first in the series that will be hosted between June and October. So we've got an excellent panel of speakers today who will be introduced in a few moments. And we're also really delighted to see that there's so many of you um, on the call and that number is keeps increasing uh, and joining us from all over the world. So thank you very much for joining us today. So with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, the chair for this event, Andrew Norton, IID Director. Thank you so much, Julia, and many thanks for all your work putting this session together. Uh, delighted to welcome you all uh, to this session on climate, COVID-19 and the collaboration we need. So this is focusing on the intersection between this extraordinarily disruptive global event, pandemic, and what we need to do going forward in relation to uh, recovery from that, building back better, but also climate action. So let me introduce the panel. We've got a fantastic panel. Um, Fatima Denton, uh, delighted to have you joining us, Fatima. Fatima is the director of the Institute for Natural Resources in Africa, which is part of the UN uh, University based in Ghana. And Fatima was, is formerly a trustee of IIED, so we're really delighted to have you with us. We also have joining us Achala Abisingi. I think all three of our speakers are alumni from IIED. Achala is the country representative for Papua New Guinea at GGGI, leading the country program on green growth and climate resilience, and also formal head of global climate law and policy at IIED. But last and definitely not least, we have Salim al Haq who is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD, in Bangladesh, who we are co-hosting this webinar series with. Um, and I want to say a few words about Salim before we start, if you'll permit me. Um, Salim has made an immense contribution to my organization, IIED, and until very recently has been wearing two hats um, for some years, one as director of ICAD, which he founded, and the other as an IIED senior fellow. Um, and he has very recently finally cut the cord with IIED and moved full, happily moved full time to ICAD. And I can't let this moment pass without a brief acknowledgement of the fantastic contribution that you have made down the years to my organization, IIED. Um, you've shaped, I think, many of the ways we think about locally based and community driven adaptation at a global level and much of that you did with IIED down the years and specifically you started IIED's work program on climate change over 20 years ago um, which is a really fundamental contribution and you built the focus of that with really outstanding clarity of vision you did such a great job identifying the strategic spaces where we could make a productive contribution, like the work program with the least developed countries, which you, Achilla, and other of our panelists took over and led with flair and distinction for many years afterwards. My colleagues have asked me to stress a couple of other things that are exceptional about you, Salim. Um, firstly, that you are a totally democratic person, that you treat everyone, whether it's a head of government or a young student, just the same, and this was something that everyone really commented on. Um, equal attention and interest to everyone. And secondly, your particular interest in mentoring and developing younger professionals, uh, the programme of CLAC Fellows at IID, I'm sure we'll have many alumni of that on this call, um, but that was a really outstanding and path-breaking programme. Um, and it is great that you are now providing that outstanding strategic vision and leadership to ICAD, building a world-class institution in Bangladesh, that it's been a real pleasure for me in my years in this job to see grow in stature and influence year on year. But on behalf of IID, thank you so much for everything that you've done for IID down the years. Now let's move to the session. Um, COVID-19 has had such a dramatic global to local impact at so many levels that it's a challenge to grasp it as a piece. 
from kind of dramatic impacts and increases in poverty and inequality to unprecedented economic contraction um, for countries and even at a global level. Um, and also rapid changes in social norms. We're all living differently wherever we are in the world to the way we were even in early January. So it's an extraordinary and unprecedented global disruption. And it's shown us that we need to abandon the old and normal ways of dealing with emergencies and thinking about disruption. It's highlighted that long-term complex challenges like climate change and short-term crises demand new ways of working and new responses. And the pandemic has also highlighted global and local inequality the world over. It's been people in the most precarious living situations and working situations who've borne the brunt both of the illness and of the economic impact. So what can we learn from the pandemic, from this experience and the global response that can help us to tackle that huge global issue of the climate crisis? So Salim, I would like to go to you first. Each panelist will speak for five to seven minutes and then we will move into a general discussion and I'll be picking up questions from the audience at that time. But Salim, please start. Thank you very much, Andy, uh, particularly for those uh, kind words of uh, introduction. Uh, actually, although I've formally uh, now left IID, it doesn't feel like I've left IID. I feel very much still part of uh, the organization because for me, you know, it, IID is full of friends and they remain friends, whether uh, you, you're still paying me any salary or not really doesn't matter anymore. Uh, and so the same thing with friends like Fatima and Achala, even though they are in different parts of the world, uh, our friendship uh, crosses those boundaries and, and remains. That's one of my uh, abiding memories of working in IID and I hope continue to work with IID going forward. Uh, so let me start by, um, sharing a few of my thoughts from where I am located here in Dhaka, Bangladesh, about the link between COVID-19, which is now uh, still a major problem here in Dhaka. We're still in lockdown, working from home over the last month and continuing to do that. Uh, but the fact that even though we have this uh, uh, public health pandemic uh, on our heads at the moment, it doesn't mean that climate change has gone away. Climate change is still there. And we were reminded of that fact just a couple of weeks ago here when we had a super cyclone, Amphan, hit, uh, fortunately for Bangladesh, it hit India first and then came to Bangladesh, but it still did a lot of damage. Fortunately, not many lives lost because we have a very, very good emergency warning system and people took shelter. More than two and a half million people were able to be get the warnings and take shelter so that the, the lives lost was minimized. But uh, nevertheless, there was a lot of damage done, particularly to the Shundarban forest, which got hit first, and then that also protected the human habitation, but there was a lot of damage uh, to the forest, the flora and the fauna there. And so, you know, the, and, and the fact that it, cyclones are not new, cyclones happen every year, but this happened to be a super cyclone because the Bay of Bengal sea surface temperature was elevated by over a degree. And I understand that the Indian government has just launched a climate satellite where they're now monitoring these temperatures on a regular basis and they have verified the fact that the Bay of Bengal temperature was elevated above normal which turned it into a super cyclone which we we rarely get normally we get normal cyclones we don't get super cyclones so this was a particularly bad one in that sense and we're likely to get more of them so the bottom line is that climate change continues climate change impacts continue and even though we have a, a COVID-19 crisis at the moment, we're going to have to deal with both crises at the same time, a public health crisis on the one hand, a climate change crisis on the other hand, and an economic crisis as a result of that as well. And so to me, just to share a few uh, thoughts of, of my own coming out of this, firstly, to me, one of the biggest lessons that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, global pandemic has brought to us is the necessity of leaders to listen to the scientists. And we have a vivid demonstration of leaders who listen to the scientists, who have protected their populations. For example, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, where Achala is now sitting, who, who are now COVID free, and the leaders of several countries, including the richest and most powerful country in the world, who refuse to listen to their scientists and are responsible for the deaths of thousands of their own citizens. I can't you know, think of anything worse as a decision maker 
of of these leaders and they, he's not the only one there are several others as well around the world which i won't name uh, but we know who they are and they they have by ignoring the science killed i'll say killed their own citizens and that is really unconscionable and climate change is another one climate change scientists have been saying this for a long time and you know they aren't listening they have to listen if they really want to help their own countries going forward uh, the second i think emphasis of uh, a, a example that or lesson that is being conveyed is we live in a globalized world there is no way to put walls and and barriers around your country you can try to do it but you're not going to do it it's not going to be effective uh, the pandemic goes around the world the virus goes across borders and bangladesh will also uh, uh, be affected as every other country will be affected and we will need to uh, work with each other so whether we like it or not the only way to take uh, our ideas forward and to come out of this crisis is to work together is to cooperate collaborate uh, share knowledge and experience and and uh, help each other as it were and then the the third and final point i will make is with regard to who gets affected and you mentioned a little earlier that the work i've been doing at iid and i continue to do is focusing on the impacts of climate change on the most vulnerable communities in the most vulnerable countries particularly the least developed countries in asia and africa as it happens the pandemic and particularly the lockdown measures in the big cities like dhaka and and mumbai and cape town and nairobi are affecting the most vulnerable communities in the slums in these big cities right now who are also the, going to be the victims of the impacts of climate change so it's a double whammy for them in the sense of the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change are also the most vulnerable to the covid-19 and therefore the corollary of that is anything we do to deal with the pandemic and the economic recovery has to take into account a, not just a green recovery or a green uh, uh, future but also an equitable recovery where we take care of the most vulnerable to me just being green is not good enough although i support a uh, green uh, uh, investments and recovery but green has to be also equitable where we think of not leaving anyone behind thinking of the most vulnerable and enabling us to support them and to be able to help them going forward so um i look forward to potentially having a further discussion about this and charting out a way in which we can continue our global collaboration across uh, the the four of us and our institutions uh, going forward i think the challenge has become bigger but the need for our collaboration has also become that much bigger as well i'll stop there for now and happy to come back later thank you very much selim very very rich comments achella would you like to go next thank you so much andy um hello to all of you um thank you for the invitation and also introduction um what a privilege to be in the panel where we also celebrate selim um selim is my guru as many of you know to put it simply i would not be where i am today without selim so thank you so much selim um i think um i joined thousands of others uh, potentially young and old and all sorts of people who had the privilege to work with you to say that uh, you taught me the best lessons in my life to fight for what i believe in fight for justice and the most vulnerable and uh, i think i'll continue to do so thank you again um and you introduced me as the um country representative of the global green growth institute this is uh, where i am now after 12 years at iied that's where i actually grew up um ggdi is an intergovernmental organization we work in 37 uh, developing countries uh, we call them our partner countries and we are all embedded in government uh, ministries uh, in png my uh, papua new guinea my team is in the climate change and development authority and we are also based in three provinces in the country and my i have an amazing team tirelessly working for uh mainstreaming climate resilience and green growth into development plans uh, and mobilize green investment in the in the country so just that's uh, just a brief introduction 
Um, Andy, you mentioned the uh, various parallels between uh, the uh, climate crisis and the COVID-19 crisis, and Salim also alluded to uh, some of it. Uh, just to highlight a few things from my side, um, that the fact that impacts are both uh, impacts are borderless. So we have to work together is a, is a point that I think we have to emphasize uh, and, and repeat. And the other one, Salim, you mentioned is actually now we are realizing it is a good idea to listen to science uh, and that, uh, that uh, we have to base our solutions on, uh, on latest science and that the long-term resilience uh, uh, has to be at the center and the inclusiveness has to be a main principle that we, uh, uh, we uh, uh, include in our responses. So as we speak right now, I understand there are a few countries in discussions on uh, Green New Deals, Europe and South Korea being most prominent players. Um, I think the whole world needs a, a Green New Deal. Uh, but I want to emphasize the fact that the fact that one uh, one solution that fits all will not work. Uh, the reason why I say it is because if you take Pacific for uh, as an example, the region has managed the COVID-19 health crisis very amazingly so far. Uh, their responses were fast. For example, leadership of Papua New Guinea took swift actions clearly communicated those to their communities and um, the team of 8.5 million people in the country abided by the rules. And it is the same in many countries uh, in the region. However, let's not forget that even with the number of limited cases, what our countries have realized is that they don't even have the basic healthcare resources and the fiscal reserves that some of the uh, countries in the North have. In some countries, even a dozen patients requiring uh, serious hospital care would strain the whole health system. Uh, so even if the region has so far avoided the worst health uh, effects, the economic impacts uh, has been devastating. I want to take the example of tourism sector. In Vanuatu, 70% of tourism workers have lost their jobs. Cook Islands has estimated to have experienced 60% of GDP loss in the country just within the first three months of COVID crisis. In Fiji, 93% of tourism sector related businesses have gone out of business. And PNG has, uh, tourism associations have uh, made desperate calls for support and there are no follow schemes in these countries. So when they're out of jobs, they're out of jobs. And the most unfortunate situation, I think as Salim also alluded to, is that this is not the only disaster these countries are facing. The region is extremely vulnerable to climate impacts such as cyclones. And unfortunately, they have lost the little gains that they have made in the process of recovering from most recent cyclones. So um, th that's the situation we are in in the Pacific. And that's why I'm saying one size fits all solution will not be suitable for these countries. Uh, so what can be done? I'm going to emphasize three areas, uh, priority areas actually for the Pacific. The first, uh, as I mentioned, the tourism sector. Uh, we need to think about opportunities and options for circular economy and resource efficiency in the, in the sector by reinforcing and enhancing the interdependent relationship between tourism and the ecosystem services, such as reefs, mangroves, forests, while promoting the, the model of uh, responsible consumption in the sector and adjacent industries. And the second one is the, uh, uh, the sustainable energy side of the whole discussion. This, is, this must be a key area in all stimulus packages because it's a huge opportunity for countries such as PNG, where access to electricity is only 10% of the total population in the country, despite abundance of renewable energy opportunities. So improving access to electricity alone will create a strong enabling environment that stimulates job creation uh, and uh, strengthens uh, other economic activities. Third, sustainable agriculture production. 
improving domestic supply chains, greening transport, creating local jobs, and ensuring greater long-term food security and resilience to climate change, I think is essential in our responses. How do we do this? First, focus on just transition. For example, in short term, it is important to make sure stimulus packages provide short-term income support for out-of-work employees. Some activities may include providing, for example, cash in exchange for green training or labor on green projects. This is uh, similar to what we have called just transition in the climate world. When we were negotiating Paris Agreement, for example, we were pushing for just transition. So here's an opportunity actually to employ the principle. And uh, the second is the NDC uh, enhancement uh, uh, exercise that all the countries are in, and also the roadmap development for low emission development strategies. And I think if you think strategically, this is an opportunity because the countries are still going through uh, the exercise of enhancing the NDCs. For example, PNG is just starting the process. So uh, I think we need to think about how to include uh, COVID-19 recovery packages and, uh, and in the NDC plans and the uh, low emission development strategies. And the third is the coalition, similar to what we had during Paris Agreement negotiations. We had um, a high ambition coalition led by Marshall Islands. We had Climate Vulnerable Forum. We had the Cartagena Dialogue. I think all these coalitions, to, coalitions now must revisit their agendas and combine COVID and climate uh, diplomacy together to push for the most ambitious um, recovery uh, in the post-COVID-19 world. Finally, I cannot forget the younger generation. I cannot emphasize enough how grateful I am to the youth of the world who have actually become better leaders than our politi political leaders. So um, I hope they take the, uh, the COVID crisis also into their consideration in pushing their adults to take responsible actions for now and for future. Some of these uh, points that I've mentioned are already in GGGI's um, uh, action uh, plans. We have uh, contacted all heads of states uh, in our partner countries through our president and chair, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, uh, and also our director general, Dr. Frank Richberman. For Pacific, we have linked our responses to short-term income support, as I mentioned, uh, and long-term uh, job creation. Um, so this is also, all these ideas are also in our country business plans for next two years and very happy to share further information if someone is uh, interested. So let me end uh, by saying that this is a crisis that we are all suffering from, but the best that come out of this is the recovery packages being used as our last opportunity for a greener, resilient and inclusive world. So. My plea is let's not waste the crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Achilla. Great points. Um, let me move to Fatima now, and then we'll try and put some of these things together as we move into the discussion. Fatima. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Andy. Um, and thanks to Salim and to, to Achilla. Um, Andy, if you would allow me, I think um, it would be a little bit um, indecent of me almost to, to say something about Salim and not to have a, a, a word or two to say. Um, um, I remember sort of going into the whole climate change discipline. Um, and I think that um, one word that comes to mind when I think about Salim is his passion. Um, Salim is a very passionate, um, you know, a strong advocate for climate change um, and a strong defender of uh, rights issues and any form of injustice, but particularly injustices that are related to climate change. Um, and many of us that came into this field, um, we were looking for literature and work that we can identify with. And he was one very prolific writer but also somebody that made it sexy, that made it appealing. Um, and also a very strong entrepreneur, I would say. That's another word that I think of when I think about Salim. 
Um, we, we didn't know much about Bangladesh, but um, Salim, we saw Bangladesh through the eyes of Salim um, and um, got to know a little bit more about that. Um, but in general, I would say for everything related to sudden empowerment, um, Salim has been that sort of great, great advocate. And for that, I'd like to thank you and for, for everything you've done also in this area, especially for being a mentor to many of us. Um, and um, Andy, um, in terms of the questions that you're asking related to COVID-19 and climate change, um, I, I sit in Accra in Ghana. Um, and I think that if we're looking at it as a, a set of parallels, one of, the, one of the important points I think to make, it's been a set of good news and bad news, I would say. Um, but I think one parallel that, that comes to mind is the fact that um, all countries, um, except for a few, uh, irrespective of their wealth, their technology, their infrastructure, were completely unprepared for this. Um, which tells me that um, the response um, and the systems we need in place, the infrastructure we need in place, the capacities that we need to build um, are not in place yet. Um, we are woefully unprepared. Um, and I think one of the lessons is how we, how we can build back better. Um, another important um, parallel for me is the fact that this has been an induction course in the possible. We have seen that this is possible. It is possible to reduce emissions drastically. It is possible um, to put people before economies. It's possible to change our behaviors. Um, it has been possible. Um, yes, we, we have seen a massive drop in terms of 5.5% in GHG, greenhouse gas emissions, and that's impressive. Um, but we're still nowhere close um, to what we need to do. Um, and I think the point that Salim made um, is a very valid point. We, even as we, as we speak, we have to think that there are three crises that are intersecting here. Um, the, uh, and, and forms of injustices that are in, intersecting. We, we haven't been able to airbrush um, you know, climate injustice with the, with the, with the, with the, with the pandemic. It's still here. Um, there are many structural problems that are still here. Um, and I think we need to look at how um, in addressing this um, crisis, uh, we, 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 we take advantage of this, as, as Charles said, not to waste it, um, to see this as um, a metaphor for, um, or a dress rehearsal um, for building back better. Um, one other um, important point I, I thought I'd make also is that um, we need to not say we've got it or we've got there. We need to say, how did we get here? Um, it's not enough, I think, to, to, to keep saying, yes, we did it. Um, and this means we have to re-examine our roadmap. We have to look at the tools. We have to look at the strategies. Uh, we have had 25 years of negotiation. Um, and it tells me that it goes back to the old discussion. Is it um, negotiation versus coercion? You know, how do we do this? Because we, 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 we haven't talked enough about the necessity for a legally binding, binding treaty. Um, and even though we got there, we got there at a cost. Um, and the cost is quite heavy, as Salim said, to some people more than others. So even as we talk about building back better, there are reference points that we need to, um, I think, um, take into account because building back better is not the same um, for Achula in uh, Papua New Guinea or for somebody in Ghana or somebody else in another part of the world. Um, so I think we need to look at that um, aspect. Third point is uh, the whole debate about sustainability versus business as usual. How do we maintain the levels of emissions reductions that we, we're seeing now? Um, some critics have said this in the past, that um, these emissions, and you said it, Andy, um, you alluded to it at least, that these emissions um, have come about as a result of economies contracting. Um, so that tells me whether this equation of, you know, endless growth um, or, you know, continue with our consumption patterns as they are, whether that is a model of development that we can, we can afford. Um, and how do we ensure that 
um, you know, the, the, the theory of decoupling growth from uh, fossil fuel productions. How do we actually do that properly? Um, for Africa, the temptation is going to mean that countries are going to take advantage of fossil fuel, cheap fossil fuel prices. It's going to be part of their economic comeback. Um, and I think that we can't, we can't deny that. Um, it is easier for a country like Zambia to take advantage of imported coal from China. And, and it's quicker for Zimbabwe to take advantage of coal that it can just dig out of the ground and South Africa to do the same. Um, so the, the economic um, um, aspect, I think, is gonna maybe occupy um, much of the attention of our African leaders than environmental sustainability. Now we have to find incentives that can encourage them to look at environmental sustainability and economic comeback um, together. Um, and many of the, 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 the Achilles heels of Africa is in the areas where we're supposed to make um, deep cutbacks. Um, so energy um, is a problem area and we need to look at how we, um, how we decarbonize our energy systems, um, but also how we can enable countries in Africa, many of them are very reliant um, on fossil fuel um, and may risk foregoing the rents that come from fossil fuel. So how do we allow them to have a kind of managed exit? Um, from, uh, from, um, from these fossil fuels. So I think those are, are all points um, that are going to be um, extremely important um, to take into, take into account. Um, but I think one last point, if I may, Andy, very quickly, is that I do not see how we can continue this trajectory if we leave behind the informal sector. Um, I think the informal sector is, you know, as I said before, I mean, I'm saying now is the, the, the Achilles heel of Africa, but it's also um, where Africa has the, the, the greatest opportunity to get even with poverty. Um, and this is a sector that has suffered under the locked, lockdown and restrictions. Um, it's also the sector where most of the jobs in Africa are contained. 86% um, of all employment is contained in this sector. Um, we have young people um, that look to the, the sector um, for work. So I think the informal sector is going to be a, a very important sector to look at. And so too, we have to learn about how we plan our urban, uh, how we do urban planning better, how we redesign cities. You know, the stimulus package, as Salim said, I do not think should be conditional to um, green at all cost, because this can be, it, it can be analogous to a traffic light um, sort of scenario where you have to have people in a fast lane you have to have people in the middle lane and you have to have people in the slow lane. Um, and it, it, it matters that each of these lanes have the relevant incentives so that they can make, um, they can make green a, a definite staple of their economies. But I think urban planning, especially in Africa, where this is the, the, the one of the regions that is urbanizing at a very fast rate, how we fix air pollution, you know, and how we um, think about urban life um, I think it's going to be an urban health. I think it's going to be um, 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 greatly um, important. So um, I'll, 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 um, I'll stop here. Um, just to say that um, Ashla mentioned um, agriculture, and I just wanted to say that in that mention, if I could say that the agricultural sector um, is one where we have to do better in Africa. Africa is importing um, Basically, it's importing food. We are oh, 35 billion in, um, in um, spending 35 billion in, um, in terms of imports, uh, but we are also um, importing food that we can produce. We are importing over 22 million ton, metric tons of maize, 47 million tons of, of wheat, um, and some of our markets are flooded uh, with goods that we can we can we can source um, from different parts of Africa. Um, so I think we need to look at this and how we, we transform the agricultural sector. I mean, agriculture is an industry in Europe. Um, in Africa, agriculture is not a lucrative business at all. Um, so these are, these are things I, I think um, that we need to look at um, in building back better. Thank you so much, Fatima. Three very, very rich presentations. If I just pick out a few points from each one, Salim was talking about 
lessons from COVID, listening to the credible science, the fact that these threats are globalized, you cannot insulate yourself from them, um, and the need for an equitable and green recovery. Um, actually, I emphasized you know, the fiscal weakness of many of the countries we're talking about. They don't have the same resources. They don't have the same options that countries with hard currencies do in terms of investment. There's a huge thing to solve there. Um, also, the need to um, bring the COVID recovery efforts into the way we look at the NDCs and the contributions to Paris. And of course, this incredible emphasis on youth um, many of the forms of activism on the street that we've seen haven't been able to continue that and have gone digital, but how does that energy continue? And a very rich set of comments from Fatima um, agree completely that this really highlights in a climate sense how unprepared many countries were for something they should have been prepared for, that it was a predictable risk. Um, but also um, the importance of the informal sector, absolutely. And in an African context for long-term resilience, this question of how cities will be shaped, formed or designed um, for a resilient and low carbon future. Um, Celine, before going to questions from the audience, can I just put you one other lesson that I think um, is interesting in this context, maybe not simple, but is the importance of urgency. Um, you mentioned some countries have handled this better than others. They're mostly the countries that went early. So it wasn't so much about how you locked down, it was about when you did. And in my country, the UK, there's an estimate from an eminent epidemiologist that 20,000 lives would have been saved had the UK locked down a week earlier. So that thing about exponential growth. now. There's a lesson there, isn't there? Because we've all been saying for a long time that there isn't enough urgency on enacting on the climate crisis, but that urgency has to be found in a global framework, not a national framework. Do you have any thoughts about how we can apply that lesson? Is it possible? Uh, yes, so I think the COVID-19 uh, crisis in itself is a good illustration of that. As you've just said, this is now self-evident. Those who moved first, listened to the science and moved first, were able to protect their citizens, their own citizens. And those who came late were not. And in fact, I, I hold them responsible for those deaths because they refused to take action. And we can make the same case for climate change on a big, much bigger scale, unfortunately on a slower time scale. So it's not immediate like uh, the COVID crisis is. And so you don't have to lock down and sit in your house uh, for weeks. But you do have to be better prepared. And, and I hope that that would be one of the biggest lessons that our leaders will take on board. And you know, going up to COP26 now, the UK is in the presidency of that. Uh, I would say the UK bears a big, big, big responsibility uh, in, in taking that message to other leaders around the world and ensuring that climate change is not dropped off the agenda. It is made a high priority. And the lesson being, those of you who will move quickly will be better off than those of you who uh, leave it till later. And that is the big lesson. Um, and again, just to pick up on our role in all of this, I think we have a big role to play in terms of getting the evidence and putting it together in a global context and not just speaking to our own national leaders, but the global leaders collectively. And in, in, in the past, I think we have not done as good a job as we should be doing, and particularly in the sort of global uh, um, think tank world, if you like, it's still very predominantly northern think tanks with a few you know, of us in the south uh, as token voices, I would say. We need to do better than that. We need to have a much more rounded uh, um, group of institutions and people working together in a much more solid uh, form of solidarity and producing the evidence that speaks to all our leaders in different ways. And Fatima is quite right. Your messages are not exactly, it's not a one size fit all message. It is, it, it is disaggregated messages, but there is a one size fit all overall message of tackling a global problem like climate change that requires everybody to be doing something, but the something that everybody does can be different in, in different places for different people. And that's really, I think, an opportunity for us as think tanks and researchers. Thank you very much, Salim. Great answer. 
Um, I'm going to move now to the questions that are coming in from the audience. And we, as uh, Juliet was explaining, we have um, this voting system on it. Um, so the, um, the, the most votes are for a very topical question, which I would like to put to all three of you. Um, and it's one that's very much in our minds here. Um, so this is from Megan Rowling. I would like to ask the panelists whether they think the UK government's move to merge DFID with the Foreign Office, with FCO, could have an impact on Britain's climate adaptation and resilience work in developing countries, and if so, how? So, um, <laughs> Achilla, would you like to have first go at that one? Shall I have a go before I tell you? Yeah, you have a go, yeah. yeah your thoughts, okay. So, um, I think it's a bad move, that's for sure. Okay. You know, the, the fact that DFID was an independent department with a Secretary of State uh, with a cabinet rank made a huge difference for the UK's aid budget to be ring-fenced to tackle global poverty and humanitarian uh, issues, which Mr. Johnson obviously does not like, and he wants it to be subordinated to political interests. And, you know, he, he, in his speech in Parliament, he calls it the great cash point in the, in the sky, which is, you know, extremely derogatory uh, view of, of de development assistance and why Ukraine shouldn't get more than Zambia. If he doesn't know the difference between poverty in Zambia and Ukraine, you know, I have no faith in him being uh, the person in charge of what to do best with money that's supposed to help the poor. On the other hand, in the climate change context, I am not really that disappointed. You know, I would prefer the UK to give their climate obligations climate finance obligations to the world that they have agreed to under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I really don't care if they're aid, they want to reduce aid to zero. Let them do that. That's their business. Shut TIFID down. What does it matter to us? But give the money that you have to give us under climate change. That is, a, that is an obligation that we will hold you to. Aid is not an obligation. Aid is just charity that you decided you want to give. And you don't want to give it, don't give it. But climate finance, you have to give, and we will fight you for that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Salim. Do either of the other panelists want to come in on that, or are you going to pass? That was a great answer. Yeah, maybe yeah no, Fatima, you. please do. Yeah, yeah I, well, I think it's not very surprising. I think we all knew it was coming, so I think it's not very surprising. Um, most of us have grown up with knowing DFID and working very closely with DFID. And I think that, um, you know, DFID has a way of um, looking at the problems related to climate change and other parts of development, you know, that is particular to DFID. Um, so, so I think the merge in a way for us, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not surprising, but we, we knew it was, gonna, it was gonna happen. And, you know, some of us are not very pleased with it, but, you know, that, that's how it is. On the other hand, I think the emerge looking at it from a foreign policy perspective is not a bad thing in the sense that most of the climate related problems do have a foreign policy dimension. Um, if you look at issues around international waters, um, that has a foreign policy um, dimension. If you look at issues around migration, um, there is a foreign policy dimension. So I think sometimes we, we tend to silo these things. Um, so I think bringing it together, that part of it at least, um, would make a lot of sense. Okay. Thanks very much, Fatima. Um, the next question is from um, AKF UK, which I take it is Aga Khan Foundation. Um, a lesson from both crises is that our leaders and organisations cannot just listen to scientists. We need a multidisciplinary approach that listens to a broad range of voices and sectors, local actors, social movements, women, the informal sector, and so on. Um, otherwise, the effects on marginalized groups will not be taken into account. How do we ensure that this collaboration happens and happens at a deep and transformative level? So, uh, great question. Who would like to take that on first? If others can't, if you want to take their time to think, I'll, I'll jump in again. So I think that that's the nuts, uh, the hub of everything. But what, what we have to realize is that the, uh, the governance and democratic space uh, within a country differs from country to country. And some countries have greater space and other countries have less so. 
Um, over the years, uh, during my time at IID and, and still now at ICAD in Dhaka, I've been doing a lot of work with the least developed countries. These are 48 of the poorest, most vulnerable countries in Asia and Africa. And within each of these countries, the de governance and democratic space varies. Some places it's more than in other places. So you have to work within what is allowed or what is available uh, to bring the different voices together. But one, is a, one universal fact, which is true even for uh, richer countries, is that poor and vulnerable members of societies always get short shrift. Decision makers, whoever they may be, even if they're elected decision makers, will listen to the rich and powerful and will help the rich and powerful, but they won't help the poor and, and the most vulnerable. And you see this now in the United States, you even see it in the UK with the COVID uh, affecting you know, uh, black and, and uh, immigrant populations. You see it with the Black Lives Matter in the US. These are manifestations of misgovernance where decision makers and rulers simply don't care about certain parts of the population. And the only thing that we can do who, who feel this injustice and want to do something is to get better organized, is to use whatever democratic space is available in whichever country we happen to be operating in and at the global level as well, and try and bring the forces for progress together uh, with our voices and we as researchers have a, a significant role to play in terms of gathering evidence and to, to the extent that knowledge, evidence, research can play a role in affecting decision making, we must use that to get the right kind of decisions to be made. So, you know, I'm, I'm always a, a normative researcher. I don't do research for research sake. I do research to get something changed in the world and, and that is fighting injustice. Thank you so much, Celine. Fatima, there's a question for you come in from Professor DG. Um, I like the discussion about environmental sustainability and the need for economic growth in poor countries in the post-COVID era. Do you, what do you think are the options for African countries um, looking at this sharp economic contraction being reported across the country, across the continent, sorry? How do you think African countries can best respond to build back better in this context? Well, um, I, think, I think, like, like we said before, um, the stimulus packages should not just take into account emissions reductions um, and make it conditional that that the you know that should be you know we we need to have a green focus um my sense is that in terms of um, african countries responding um i would say that um, there are several ways in which we can respond i think firstly um and this is probably the reason why i say we shouldn't just focus on you know, on emissions. It, it, it's a wholesale transformation, by the way. Um, when we focus also on energy systems or emissions at all costs, we miss the other parts um, that are fundamental to Africa's development. Um, I uh, alluded to agriculture as a, as a sector um, that, you know, is um, where it, it's, it's Africa's bread, bread basket, basically. That's where our food and everything else is reliant on. So if we, if we build back better and we don't take into account agriculture um, and agricultural practices and how we make that stronger, um, then we, we might not go very far. Um, but um, similarly, I think we could also look at the ways in which we can look at technology differently. Um, this crisis has really um, made more apparent um, the technological injustices also. You know, um, if you look at it from a digital perspective, most um, African parents cannot afford um, for their children to um, follow courses and, you know, go to school through um, virtual classes and internet um, because um, it's, it's, very, it's very expensive to be connected here in terms of bandwidth and, and all of that, um, all of those, um, those issues. So I think we are way behind uh, from a technological perspective, from a digital perspective. Um, and these are areas where we need to, where we need to do better. Um, by the way, also to say that um, the, one of the reasons why I keep coming back to agriculture is um, the fact that most of our emissions um, are not in um, energy. Um, most of the emissions that we produce are emissions that are um, coming from agriculture. Um, land degradation and land use change. And that's why I think it's very important that, you know, we make agriculture front and, and, and center in terms of our response systems. 
Um, other sectors could be manufacturing, for instance. You know, Af Africa does have um, an aspiration to industrialize. Um, we cannot industrialize in the way that Europe has done. Uh, we have to industrialize differently. We have to look at other forms of energy systems to be part of our industrial um, sort of value chain. Um, but that also comes at a cost. And like I said, there is this temptation to go for cheap energy where, where we find that. Um, and you cannot industrialize without energy. So energy is going to be a very important part um, of that industrialization um, um, trajectory. Uh, but we are employing less, fewer people in manufacturing than we should. Um, so more efforts um, have to be geared towards the manufacturing sector. Um, and like I said, again, the informal sector has to be supported. It's a sector that's hemorrhaging. It's a sector that's affected by lockdowns, by stringent impositions of curfews and, and, and restrictions. Uh, most of our food systems are contained within this sector as well. Um, so I think these are all ways that we can, we can build back better and where we can, we can have better response systems. Um, but again, I, I have to emphasize that, you know, the, the, the historical emissions have to be looked at. We cannot just um, be rushed into a pathway that says, yes, you must go green. Um, greening is not going to happen overnight in Africa. Um, there are many countries that see their fossil fuel industry as part of their sovereign rights, um, and they would want to continue to take advantage of that. So I, I really feel that we need to dissuade them from going down that lane. We need to say that this is a blind alley um, and that maybe the future is green, but it's green based on how we can support you in achieving some of your strategic goals, education, you know, making sure that our public health system is really fit for future. Um, so these are all, I think, ways in which we can, we can, we can, we can support um, um, the, the region in terms of how it can get, um, it, it can get better. But, 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 but and, Andy, every time we, we talk about this, I always feel like, um, to some extent, we are not also talking about the relevant infrastructure that will support that. And I think Salim talked about solidarity. Solidarity also starts with, you know, not slapping a 30% tariff charge on processed food like chocolate bars when cocoa is sourced from Ghana or sourced from Cote d'Ivoire. You know, we have to look at these subsidies that are granted to farmers in Europe. For every hectare of land, they receive a subsidy. Um, and how is an African farmer supposed to compete with that? So, so, so building back better, again, starts with making sure that those injustices do not get heightened, do not become even more perverse. Thank you very much, Fatima. Um, before we close, there's another question I would like to put to you. Um, and it's opening a big can of worms, but I hope you can deal with it fairly quickly. It's from my colleague, Simon Anderson in IAD, who you all know well. Um, it's about the fiscal space that poorer countries need to invest in transitions and recovery. Um, debt relief obviously has to be a huge part of that. We all know that at this point. How can we leverage the process such that debt relief is part of the just transition process? Fatima, do you, can I go to you again on that one? Well, well just to say that, you know, um, and, and Simon knows this, country like Nigeria that rely a lot on, um, you know, fossil fuel, oil um, and gas have had to revise their forecast in terms of rents that they're getting from this. Um, many countries are highly, highly indebted. Um, the um, um, foreign exchange earnings that they could get from these resources are no longer there. So um, it, it makes them even more um, um, sort of, I mean, it, it increases um, their vulnerability in terms of how they might um, service their debts. Um, so that, that is a problem as it is. Um, so in terms of the, I think there's a lot of talk about debt forgiveness. Um, but I think that, again, you know, we have to put things in perspective. I think definitely um, we, we need to look at where countries would want to move away from carbon intensive sector. Perhaps there might be some debts that could be forgiven so that those countries would be able to take um, advantage of that space um, and build a manufacturing sector, build the agricultural sector, you know, um, support better urban planning. So I think some, some of that could be useful, 
um, if it's channeled in the right direction and if it's helping these countries also achieve some of their sustainable development goals. But I don't think it should be towards the agenda of, um, you know, northern countries to say, yeah, we will do this, but provided you, you, you give us that. I think it should also speak to the broader strategic goals um, of poorer countries so that they take advantage of that fiscal space as well. Thank you so much, Fatima. Great answer. I am now going to move to the last question to all three panelists. But first, let me say huge apologies to anyone who I didn't get to your question on. Um, there were many more than I could have dealt with. But if you would like an answer to your question, please feel free to email me and I'll forward it to the panelists for them to respond afterwards. So the last question. Um, Going forward, what is our role and what kind of collaboration do we need? Achila, can I go to you first on that one, please? Thank you so much, Andy. Um, I think I did mention uh, several options for collaboration at uh, global level as well as uh, at local level. Um, some of the uh, comments I think Fatima and uh, Salim mentioned also um, emphasize the need for um, social inclusion and gender equality. And that's something I think we have to uh, 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 keep in mind in terms of uh, um, making our coalition stronger uh, because that people-centered approach I think uh, will uh, be uh, better in terms of uh, building back better and it has to be a people-centered approach and there, there are um, uh, there are options and there are examples for optimism. This has happened in, in countries like New Zealand where actually uh, the leaders took a people-centered approach for uh, a, um, a, a better uh, response to the, um, not only just the COVID crisis, but also the climate crisis through the uh, Carbon Neutral Act and, and other actions they are taking. So in terms of diplomacy, I mentioned that we need a coalition's uh, countries to come together, those ambitious countries, developed or developing countries from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia, uh, and the Pacific to come together uh, to push for uh, things that we actually, at, in the negotiations, in, in climate negotiations, some uh, actually uh, still uh, think that the Paris Agreement was not good enough. But being in this, at the center of the negotiations, I know until the last minute, we didn't think we were going to get 1.5 degree target, or we didn't uh, think we were going to get a provisional on loss and damage, and we got them, and the countries are now preparing their plans to actually uh, take those um, actions forward. So I think the coalitions, both at national, uh, global level and uh, national level and local level, that are people-centered uh, is extremely important. One thing I think we, uh, all of us, um, didn't mention enough is the private sector participation. I think the, the business-friendly environment uh, to address those uh, challenges that Fatima is mentioning in, uh, in Africa, for example, is the same for uh, the Pacific. In, in, in uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, the uh, business-friendly environment is not there yet. And we need to uh, put those business-friendly environment to encourage private sector to come in to actually invest in the green sector. Uh, so um, yeah, I will stop there. And just maybe last point to say that in terms of debt release and all these trillions of money that's going to be injected into addressing the COVID-19 crisis is actually going to be, majority of it is going to be borrowing against our future generation's income many more years to come, five, 10, or even longer. And the governments are spending money now, today, uh, 10 or 15, 20 times more than their budget allocations. And so that needs to be meaningfully spent. And uh, otherwise, uh, our future, we are putting our future generations into even more debts, but without taking uh, a meaningful approach to actually utilize the resources to uh, be more uh, uh, a socially inclusive and uh, develop in a sustainable manner. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you, Achila. Thank you for that and for your great contribution throughout. 
Um, Fatima, you next. Um, I think both Achila and um, Salim have mentioned this. Um, I think solidarity is a key word. Um, the, the paradox might be that the solidarity that we saw in COVID-19 uh, might probably now end up in isolationism um, as we as we we go forward, um, where you know um, countries are, are thinking more about their short-term economic benefits, um, and you know that 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 might be the result of that. So 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 yes, I think solidarity is uh, is going to be key. Um, a key um, concept um, or practice rather that we should we should all lay back on and all sort of take advantage of. Um, that said, I think also an, another point or another word that um, actually I mentioned is this coalition of voices. Yes, it is true that um, scientists were at the you know um, forefront of this um, pandemic, but you know some scientists also got it got it wrong, <laughs> and some scientists also acted acted way too slow, uh, which tells us that yes, science is important, you know, um, but um, science has to, you know, it, it's a science of humanity. Science has to come together with people. So we need to, you know, enlarge the space um, for science to have a place, but for other voices in Africa, we've seen parliamentarians, we've seen religious leaders, you know, um, researchers all come together um, in this shared space. So I think we need to have that form of deliberative democracy where we see different people coming together because it, it is a shared problem and we, it's only through that way um, that we're going to address it. And this also means that northern and southern researchers have to come together. Um, the, 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 the solution is not a solution for one region. Um, it's a solution that we all have to be part of. Um, so I think when we're thinking about all of these ways forward, you know, it's important that we use um, our collective force, um, our collective intellect um, in, in addressing the problem. So I really do feel that this is um, a new opportunity um, for, for researchers in the North and in the South um, to come together. Thank you very much. And going last to Salim, just Salim, I just need to say, I, I don't know if you've been seeing, but I've been seeing lots of messages flashing up in the chat box in tribute to your incredible contribution. The one, if you didn't see it from Paus Manjaju, who's a, a, a great leader also of the Least Developed Countries Group, now doing great work in the Global Climate, in the Green, sorry, the Green Climate Fund. Mm -hmm. So anyway, let me go to you last now with the question, what is our role and what kind of collaboration do we need? Thank you very much, Andy. This has been an extremely rich uh, conversation. It's great to uh, uh, share thoughts with uh, good friends like yourselves. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to end with a, a very practical way forward, in my view. And that is to, to uh, link myself, which I do in my day job, with Article 11 of the Paris Agreement, which uh, uh, Achala mentioned. It was, it was a f we had to fight for it. It's on capacity building. It's not a particularly uh, contentious issue. Everybody loves capacity building. But we had to fight to get the article in the Paris Agreement to challenge the way capacity building was being done until then, which was northern countries sending consultants to come in to developing countries, do a workshop, and fly out. We call it fly in, fly out capacity building, with leaving very little behind. And we challenged that, and we got a new article included that said, that capacity building is needed in all countries to deal with climate change, and that in-country capacity building systems have to be developed. And as I said, my day job is in a university. We do networking of universities in Bangladesh and across the least developed countries. And so we are investing a lot of our time and effort in enhancing the capacity to do capacity building, not just doing these one-offs. Uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Mizan Khan, with, with a couple of his uh, students, did an analysis of all the NDCs that have been submitted. And interestingly, he found that the demand of capacity building was higher than the demand for finance. You know, everybody wants more capacity building. It's a new problem. They don't know what to do, as Fatima's question. You, even the scientists were telling them what to do. We don't know exactly what to do either. You know, we, we, we think we know, we can give some advice, but we don't know if it's going to be useful or not. And so 
I think we, uh, we as researchers, universities, uh, think tanks, we have a, a particularly important role to play in developing that knowledge base and supporting decision makers from all sectors, from the, the national decision makers down to the local level in providing them with adequate and sufficient knowledge that they can then use in taking their own decisions as to what they want to do or what they need to do. And I think that's a, a big gap that at the moment, uh, you know, there's not much happening there. Uh, there's only little bits and pieces happening and it's very Northern centric in terms of uh, both the funding and the, the issues that they want to talk about. So, you know, just to take climate finance, for instance, a lot of money to do mitigation in the poorest countries who have very little emissions, but almost no money to do adaptation, which is what they need to do it. Uh, and so, you know, that lopsidedness in the funding structure is something we can argue against and, and try and rectify, but at the same time, we can also engage in meaningful research that demonstrates the value of this kind of research. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, it was so great to have the three of you with us. A fantastic conversation. Please, everyone on the call, have a look out for future events in this joint series between IIED and ICAD looking at this moment of great turbulence and what it means for the way in which we can face these um, challenges going forward, the climate crisis and others like COVID. So huge thanks to Celine, to Achala and to Fatima for your great contributions. Thanks to everyone who participated. And um, yeah, thanks very much to everyone and bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye -bye.